Hello! We're here today with Jasper Kent, author of the terrific Danilov Quintet, uh, the last of which, book five, uh, is out October 23rd this year. It's called The Last Rite. Uh, it's a vampire series set in 19th and early 20th century Russia. My name is Mark Barrowcliffe, also known as M.D. Lachlan, author of the Wolf's Angel series, and known as Mark Alder, author of Son of the Morning, uh, The Banners of Blood, historical fantasy series. So, Jasper, you've just come to the end of a five-book series, mm -hmm. uh, wide-ranging Russian historical fantasy involving vampires, Napoleon, war. Uh, why this period? Why? Um, I guess it started at the beginning, which is a very good place to start, as the song goes, uh, that I, uh, I first had the idea, I was, I was looking for a vampire story, and, I, and it came up that it, in my mind that it would be good to do it with Napoleon. Um, and my immediate first thought was actually um, the Peninsula War, having Red Sharp and that sort of thing. But then it very quickly occurred to me that um, the cold of the, uh, the retreat from Moscow in 1812 was a much better setting for vampires. And then it kind of started leaping forwards in that looking at the history around 1812 um, led me on to the Decemberists, who were the uh, officers who had, basically after Napoleon's invasion, they'd gone and occupied Paris and suddenly discovered how much more liberal... Uh, the West was, and so 13 years later in 1825 they revolted against the Musar, and that's the base of the second book, and then having thought about that, I, I just saw this whole arc of a historical story, uh, you know genuine history, uh, taking us all the way through to the Russian Revolution We've had quite a lot of vampires uh, in modern fantasy and horror, horror fiction if that had to be one fantasy figure of the last 10 15 years, 20 years even, if you go back to Anne Rice, uh, vampires have been extremely popular. Was it that that drew you to them, or was there some other reason? that? Uh, no, it was, it was that, but offset by quite a number of years, sort of late 70s, early 80s, uh, when I was watching Hammer on telly, reading Stephen King and that sort of thing. That's, that's when they, they lodged in there as being a good type of uh, monster. Because your vampires are quite... Um, visceral, bloody vampires, aren't they? Yeah, they, I mean, particularly in 12, I really wanted to, to kind of get away from um, the, the Anne Rice feel of, mm. um, of them being very sophisticated. Mm. Um, and so that I, I made them like that. And then as the series went on, I discovered you can't do much if you're, if you're visceral all the time, if you've got no sort of smart vampires. Mm -hmm. So um, things changed a bit. And then I had to have a reason why... Um, the the first lot were so visceral. It actually comes into a very um, important plot strand that I've got the idea that uh, obviously you become a vampire by exchanging blood with a vampire. Mm -hmm. and, um, in my law, it's got to be exchanged both ways and then you've got to die. But I also thought, well, what happens if after you become a vampire, you continue that exchanging relationship with another vampire? Uh, what kind of transformation does that have for you? And then I came to the conclusion that, that one of the vampires, whichever one was the naturally more dominant, would become extremely dominant and the other one would kind of wither. And that's how we end up with the, um, with, with, with the particularly visceral and intelligent vampires that you see in 12. OK, you've finished this series, five books. You're at the end now. Are there any plans for any more or is that it? As far as I'm concerned, I think that's it for a good long while, uh, both for vampires and for this particular series. Mm. Um, I've got a few ideas of filling in the gaps, maybe, because the, there's obviously big gaps between mm. things, um, and uh, maybe some short stories just to fill that in. Like It turns out, as I discovered as I was writing the last book, that... Um, Dimitri, who's one of the catch comes all the way through, um, was on the Titanic. Um, mm -hmm. And so I thought that might be a nice little short story to uh, see what, what actually happened. He just mentions in passing he was there. So uh, there's quite a few others like that. Interesting to see that you say that you discovered something, because I know that you plotted your novels very, very carefully, didn't you? You're mm -hmm. not a seat-of-the-pants author. Uh, does sometimes something surprise you? Yes. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, the, the twist in 12... Um, came after I'd completely plotted. I think I'd written about two chapters and I realised the big twist at the end um, could work with, with tiny changes. And I would like that, that in a twist, that if 
if you can surprise yourself with it, mm -hmm. if, if it's not wound in there. And in, in The Last Rite, um, I, I, again, all plotted, coming up to the you know, last three chapters, the absolute new bomb, and I was just thinking, it's not quite there. And I thought, what's the worst thing that could happen to, to my lead character, to Mikhail? Um, and, I, and I made that happen. Um, and again, it turned out to be not huge changes to go back through and make that consistent with the, with the rest of it. Things like, you know, uh, the fact that Dimitri was on the Titanic. Um, I mean, I knew plot-wise he'd been to America and Europe, and it, just a conversation um, that, uh, that they were having. At the time of the revolution, the rich in uh, St. Petersburg and Petrograd basically completely ignored it. So on the night when the uh, Winter Palace fell and, and the Bolsheviks took over, um, all the, the rich, because they still were, uh, were, were eating out and going to the theatre and that sort of thing. And so they were having a conversation about this, compared it to the fact that if you're on the Titanic, would you bother to try and save your life, or would you just have one last good meal? And Dimitri points out he was on the Titanic and he did have a good meal. <laughs> <laughs> yes, The People's Will finishes with the assassination of Alexander II. Uh, the last rite starts in 1917. What happens... Uh, in between those dates? Historically, obviously, um, yeah. we've got um, Alexander II, who was a very liberal czar if, you know, in his own terms, but he, he was a reformer. Mm -hmm. uh, he was succeeded by his son Alexander III, who most certainly was not, and he was then succeeded by Nicholas II, who again was not. Uh, and Nicholas II is obviously the czar who was overthrown um, at the revolution. Uh, so that's what's happened historically. Um, the, the main character, uh, Michal, who's uh, Alexei's grandson, Alexei from 12, uh, he's um, been in the army, fought in Japan, um, so missed the 1905 revolution, and then um, become involved in the um, Imperial Air Service, which he is living with his mistress, Nadia, in Petrograd, um, almost starving like many people were. The other thing that's happened, though, is um, that Zmeyevich, uh, also known as Dracula, has died. Um, and as far as I'm concerned, he died in 1893, pretty much as described by Bram Stoker. Mm -hmm. And that was always the, the intention for me, right back when I introduced him, didn't call him Dracula, just called him Zmeyevich, which is a Russian form of the name. Which obviously leaves um, something of a gap, perhaps, but uh, then how that's filled is, uh, is really what the book's all about. Mm -hmm. You, how, do, how do you cope, what's your attitude to historical events? Do you find yourself able to move the date of battles or to move... No, and I, I like the way you say able, yeah. because I just can't. I, no, just I can't <laughs> cheat about any of those things. Um, so um, what I hope you could say historically, uh, looking back at mine, I mean, I know I've made mistakes, I've made mistakes but, but in terms of what I'm trying to do, that given a few people tell a few lies, particularly about there being vampires there, then, then I'm historically accurate. Twelve, I think, I was, was quite extreme on that because we didn't meet any major historical figures except in, in passing. It's a choice for any historical novelist, the, your focus, isn't it? Because you know, if you, historical novelist, historical fantasy... You've got the grand history, and then you've got the tiny history. And in my experience, they, they both bring uh, their own particular set of problems. Is that your experience too, or do you, do you, do you find uh, one more problematic than the other? By the tiny history, you mean things I'm, like I mean the how much of, was a cup of tea? And yeah, the, yeah. The, the kind of tea they're drinking, exactly, and all yeah. that kind of stuff, yeah. Yeah, I, I find the grand history um, useful in the end. Because it means when I'm starting the novel, I can lay down a calendar. This happened then, this happened then. I've got to get a plot that works around those. And because, as I say, I'm not, uh, I, I just refuse to, to cheat those dates. That, that forces me to, to make the structure work. The detailed history is harder. Um, again, because I'm quite punctilious about it, as I'm sure you are, that, that I do want to know those things and not just make them up. And sometimes you, you, you cheat a bit, I think, on that. Uh, more often I'll brush over it and find a way of phrasing what's happening that, that doesn't need that precise detail of, of what the price was and things like that. And I was thinking about this the other day, actually. That's a lot easier to do in a novel than, say, in a film. Um, you know, if you 
just take a, a, a single shot in a film, there's going to be so many things in the background that should be historically accurate, and, and it's impossible to get that right. Whereas, you know, if if you're writing, you fill in bits of background, but you only fill in the bits that you know, you know, you've done the research to know what they're going on, so you're, you're making life easier for yourself. I hear you're big in Turkey. Yes. Um, I mean, probably in terms of copies sold, as many as in the UK. Gosh. Which... Uh, is, is good. Um, don't know entirely why. What, I mean, they, they did a really big push on 12. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think, you know, from the start, so just to give it a chance, and they had this um, uh, parade sort of thing through the streets of Istanbul. With, parade? Um, well, they, they had 12 blokes dressed up as the Prichniki, the, the oh, 12 wow. vampires, uh, you know, looking rough and carrying swords and that sort of thing, um, and handing out flyers. And that was on the... the Turkish news. I love, I love Turkey. Istanbul's a terrific town. It's lovely, yeah. Uh, what's on the table next? Two things that I'm working on. One is I've already written, actually. I wrote a detective story um, based in Brighton in the 1930s. Um, and I've got a couple more of those um, broadly plotted. So I'm trying to sell those at the moment. Um, but also it's, it's a different thing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'm a horror author, not a, uh, a detective fiction author. So we'll see how those go. And then... Um, the next horror um, is uh, that I'm thinking about. I haven't quite plotted yet, I wouldn't say, but it's going to be um, a contemporary black magic story. Well, I think it's going to be a trilogy, actually. I thought I desperately wanted to write a standalone story, having mm. written five in a row. Yeah. But it just wouldn't work. I just couldn't get. You know, I, I saw the end of book one and, and thought, something's got to happen after this. You're at the last book of the series mm-hmm. now. Uh, when is it out? Uh, 23rd of October. Oh, 23rd of October. The title for the camera? Uh, the Last Right. The Last Right. And can you give us a quick summary? Why should I read it? Uh, you should read it because um, the previous book, The People's Will, ends dot, dot, dot. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, that, that suggests that the story isn't over. Um, and... The story isn't over for a number of different reasons. Um, partly because the story of Russian history that I was trying to tell, um, not that it ends with the Russian Revolution, but that's certainly a, a chapter. <laughs> yeah. It's a natural point for a book, yes. as they say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> the, the thing about it is, it all relies on an absolute 180 degree turn of events um, about halfway through, mm-hmm. um, which hopefully it will surprise everybody. It's called The Last Right. Um, it's um, partly called that because um, one of the themes that goes through it is the Rite of Spring, which was first performed in um, 1913 in Paris, but written by um, Stravinsky. Um, and one of the... and, and um, choreographed by uh, Yudinsky. Is that right? Don't look at me. Sure. The music. Go on. <laughs> I'll make it, it, it was written by Stravinsky. It was, it was um, no. anyway. Everyone. everyone I know the, 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 the mythical riot. Yeah, the, 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 the riot. riot no, the, I mean it was. Well, it's probably a bit overplayed. Yeah. But anyway, um, and all these Russians, absolutely, um, creatively geniuses. Of yeah, there was a lot of land at that point. Um, had left Russia. Yeah. Um, and. That was another the, the, the brain drain, as we might call it. But that's a problem that faced Russia at the time. Also faced it after the revolution. It wasn't like the revolution was going to make people like that um, <laughs> want to go back. Um, so that's where the, the right of spring comes in, and, and it's a theme that runs through the book. But also this this turning point halfway through, it takes is a rite, a ceremony that takes place in the church on spilled blood, which is the church that was erected to mark the point where Alexander II was assassinated. Mm-hmm. So. That's basically the end point of. And the, this church exists in reality. Oh yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, saying it's, it's, it's all it, real. <laughs> well, no, no, this is this is the terrific thing about uh, when you research a lot of history, you find these things that yeah, actually yeah. fit, seem more uh, from a fantasy novel than they do yes, from, absolutely. from reality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, thanks very much, Jasper, and uh, it sounds fascinating. And best of luck with the new book. It's you thoroughly deserve it. Thanks very much.